going to dive right into the word this morning. I, I'm going to be with you quick and short, that possibly. And um, we're going to be in Luke chapter 15, verse 20 through 24 today. If you don't have a Bible, it's okay. But we do. I do ask if you're sitting down that you would stand. If you are able to stand, uh, I ask that you stand for the honoring of God's word in the house. Wherever there is the presence of God and the honor of the word, there is the power of God. So I'm say amen. And so just a couple verses today is all I need. And if you don't have it, it's going to be on the screen. Luke chapter 15, verse 20 through 24. This is the story of the prodigal son, if you haven't heard before. But I believe that we have misinterpreted this text. And, and we're going to talk about it today. Amen. Amen. It's going to be on the screen. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, someone said way off. His father saw him and had compassion and ran. Someone say ran. And, fought and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer, some say, worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. They began to party. Someone say party. As you find your seat this morning, would you tell your favorite neighbor, whichever one it is, uh, the title of my message? And you might be old enough to, to remember this, but uh, I was waiting for you at the dough. I was waiting for you at the door yeah, for, all my, for all my people over 40. Door. I was waiting for you at the door. I was waiting for you at the door. Yeah, I like the dough, yeah. Amen. Holy Spirit, thank you for what you're going to do in this room in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If there's anything that we must celebrate today among any other day, it is that the God that we know, the God that we serve, the God that we believe in, Jesus of Nazareth, is not a dead God, but he is a living God. That we have to understand if there's any other day that to celebrate. I'm thankful that I'm on this side of the cross because I get to celebrate not only that my God is alive today, but last week, last year, last year, next week, next year, next month, whatever it is. Every single day when I wake up, I have to understand, know, believe, and tie myself to that they put other gods in the grave and they are still in the grave. They put Confucius in the grave and he is in fact still in his grave. They put Muhammad in the grave and he is still in fact in the grave. They put Buddha in the grave grave and he is in fact still in the grave but when they tried to put our God the God that we serve Jesus the son of the living God the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world when they put him in the grave he didn't stay there because you can't bury life we have to understand that when you put when we have this moment where we understand believe and and tie ourselves to that we do not serve a God who's asleep we do not serve a God who slumbers we don't serve a God who's not in complete control we serve a God who is not dead but our God is alive we have to understand from, from Genesis to Revelation, we have to see if he is water, he's living water. If he's wind, he's a mighty rushing wind. If he's a fire, he's an all-consuming fire. Our God does not sleep, nor does he slumber. He has arms, heads, eyes, ears, and he is in fact not dead. He is alive. That today, among every other day, that today is nothing more special because we are on this side of the cross. We did not have to wait Friday. We did not have to mourn as they ripped his flesh from his skin. We did not have to cry and weep as they ripped his beard out and mocked him. We did not have to wonder when they put him in the grave if he was going to be who he said he was. Or they, We didn't have the anxiety of the silent Saturday on this side of the cross from the moment that I was born to the day that I live right now. I stand in the fact that my God is alive that my God I don't serve a God who's intimidated by other gods he is not idle nor is he idle you won't find him lifted up at a buffet anywhere he is the living moving breathing powerful omniscient omnipotent obscient he is all God I'm gonna preach myself happy but you have to understand if there's anything we must understand it is that our God is alive that on Friday they killed him, 
And on Saturday, they thought they had won, but just when Satan thought he had it under control was the moment that he realized that he made the worst mistake of his life when he messed with the innocent blood of Jesus. They put him in the grave because we have to understand Friday, I'm gonna get away from where I'm at, but Friday, the cross is an indicator that he loved us. But without Sunday, the cross is just an indicator that he loved us. The cross is just an indicator that he was madly in love with, that he was mad about us. Honestly, the cross indicated that he kind of was crazy because he was, it was a joy set before him that he endured the cross. But without Sunday, Sunday, see, the cross is an indicator that God loves you. But Sunday is an indicator that God's love doesn't just love you, that God's love can save you. That's with, because without the cross, the cross is the, the worth that you, that you are worth it. It's not just the punishment for death. It's the price he paid for you. It, it, it's the prince, it, is the, it is God in himself reconciling the world back to himself. The cross shows us that he loves us. The resurrection shows us that his love was powerful enough to save us. It's not just the cross. The resurrection shows us that his love doesn't just leave us where he found us, but it transfers us out of darkness into marvelous light, from addiction to adoption, from bitterness to... And we have to understand everything is centered around our God being alive. If the, Paul even said it, if, if Christ has not risen from the dead, then we preach in vain, and our preaching is useless. But on the third day, we know, believe in, tied ourselves to the reality that he is no longer there, that he, in fact, did rise from the dead, defeating death, hell, and the grave, went to hell, emptied it, got the keys to the kingdom, ascended unto heaven, and now is seated on the right hand of the Father, making intercession on your behalf. We have to understand if there's anything that can make you get up, jump around, turn upside down, it is the reality that God's love doesn't just love you. His love saves you. This is not an ordinary kind of love. This isn't a fly-by-night, cute kind of love. This is a turn your life upside down, turn it around, set it, ground, set it on solid ground kind of love. This is love that would put on flesh get off of his throne, step down, put on humanity, that he, he actually is subject to the thing that he gave subject to, and die a death in humility unto death for you. We have to understand everything is centered around. It's not, to, listen, next week we will celebrate that Jesus is risen. The week after, we will celebrate that Jesus is risen. Three Sundays from now, four Sundays, five Sundays from now, if you came here today to celebrate the fact that Jesus is risen, come back next week and the week after and the week after because we'll be doing the same thing because our Jesus didn't just rise on this day. He is seated in heavenly places making intercession on our behalf. But in our text, there is a there is an interesting dynamic that this, and not to, not to, you know, clown on other preachers or say that they preached it the wrong way, but we have preached this message of the prodigal son from a different perspective because Jesus is a friend of sinners. He was not like you and I. We, we are like him. He is not like us. We have to understand that when Jesus came, the Pharisees and the religious hated him because he was not what they thought he would be that he was eating with the sinners. The Bible says that he was a friend of sinners. He didn't come to sit with the Pharisees and the religious and the people that thought they were worthy, but he was found with the lowest of the low and the hurting of the hurting and the broken of the broken. He was found eating, and the Pharisees come to Jesus in our text today and say, Jesus, why are you eating with people that we won't even let in our temple? Why are you, you claim to be the son of God, and you're eating with sinners? You claim to be the son of God, and they call them a drunkard and... And it was interesting because Jesus began to tell the reason why. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I am a better seeker than I am a savior. And I came to seek and save. And so he begins to tell a story. 
And he tells the story of a woman who lost a coin and spent all of the coins that she had to find the one coin that she lost. And then he tells another story of a shepherd who lost a sheep and then he left the sheep. We all know this story. He left, left the sheep to go after the one sheep. And then he says, and there was a man who had two sons. And we, as the, hum, the humanity of our flesh puts the emphasis on the son when Jesus is not telling a story about the son. He's telling a story about the man. This story of the prodigal son, we have preached the wrong way for so many years because Jesus is not telling a story about the son. He's telling a story about a man who had two sons. He says the kingdom of God is like a man. He doesn't say the kingdom of God is like a prodigal son. He says the kingdom of God is like a man who had two sons. And this son... One son came to him, and let me just put it in layman's terms for you. The son said, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance. Give it to me now. Anybody have some, like rich, rich uncles that you're just like waiting to die? No? No one. <laughs> if he's in the room, don't look at him. Just a... Uh, But the son grew tired of waiting for his inheritance. So this is not, dad, give me what belongs to me. This is, dad, I wish that you were no longer alive. And he says, I want my inheritance now. Give it to me. And the dad gives him everything that belongs to him, which is beautiful, right? We're not, remember, remember we're not talking about the son. We're talking about the dad. The dad gives him his inheritance. And the Bible tells us this son goes and spends it all on wasteful living, to say the least. He spends it on parties. He spends it on alcohol. He spends it on prostitutes. He spends it all, and he finds himself at the lowest of the low, so much so that he has now lost his entire inheritance. He has no money left. And the Bible tells us that he, in fact, no one will give him nothing. That he finds himself in a pig pen willing to eat pig sloth. And it's, it's interesting because this is where Paul says, don't forget that you were once far away from God. Don't forget that you were once out of it altogether. Don't, do not forget to remember. I love that. Do not forget to remember that you were once without God with no hope. No understanding of the covenants of God. No understanding of the promises of God. And he goes a step further that you were in fact an enemy of God. But God yeah. purchased you with his own blood and brought you near in the darkest hour of your life. In the, in the addiction, in the worry, in the fear, in the bitterness, in the affair, in the mess, in the junk. This is not a picture of the prodigal son. This is a picture of you and I. That we were once without hope. Yep. Yeah. No God. Yeah. Out of it altogether. Right. No understanding of the covenants. No understanding of the promises of God. But God demonstrated his own love. And it's interesting because right here we begin to shift and we begin to look at the prodigal son, which is just a message of the gospel, message of Jesus Christ. And the, we put the emphasis on the prodigal son came to, him, came to his senses and he begins to think, the slaves and the servants of my father's house eat and sleep better than me. And I begin to think about this story, and I was preparing for you today, I begin to think about this story, and I begin to think about you and I. Because the truth is, this man, this son, has hope. Now, he wouldn't have hope if his dad was dead. If his dad was dead, 
There, was, there would be nothing to go back to. If his dad was dead, everything that he had already spent would be all that he had. If his dad was dead, if his dad, but his dad was alive. His dad was alive. So he had no hope, but he did have hope because his dad wasn't dead. His dad was alive. And we have to understand in this moment, he begins to think that my God is not dead. And he begins to, like you and I, we see in this text, he begins to think about what he's going to say when he sees his dad. I'm sorry, man. I won't do it again, I promise. God, if you get me out of this one, I promise to never do it again. I promise this time it's going to be different. God, if you'll get me. And he says, man, I'm just not even, I'm not even worthy to be your son. Isn't it interesting, humanity? Because he, he, you're never worthy to be a son. You're just a son. You're a son because you're a son. And this is where Adam and Eve began to fall. This is the fall of humanity was the son was trying to be something that he already was and was shaming himself for not living up to something that no one was asking him to live up to. And he says, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to be your son. I'll be a slave if you'll let me back. Don't you hear us in the culture? God, if you'll just save me, I'll serve you all of my life. If you save me, I'll be a servant in your house. If you say, and it, I love this because as he's approaching the house, he's writing his message and, and he, I can just it put myself in the story. I'm thinking about the anxiety. Like I've lost $100 of somebody's money. This man lost his inheritance, like half of everything his daddy had and is about to go back and ask if he can come back. <laughs> I can think about the anxiety and the feeling, but remember, this is not about the son. Because as he approaches the house, the Bible says that there was a man who was waiting at the door for him. This is not about the son. This is about while the son was out doing all the crazy nonsense that he was doing, there was a, there was a man on his front porch. My son's coming home soon. My son, I'm, I'm, I was waiting for you at the door. I was waiting for you at the door. I was waiting for you at the door and you see you see this moment where the dad finally sees you can imagine for a moment just the silhouette of what looks like his son and the bible says the bible doesn't just say things to say things it says that he was far away when he was far off can you hear can you hear paul he was far off. The Bible says that the father, who the kingdom is like, jumps off of his porch and runs to his son. Now wait. Now wait. Because we hear that. I think cardio is demonic. We should never run anyway. You feel me? I got an amen from Stephen today. The Bible says, I mean, the Bible says it. If you're running, no one's chasing you, you're an ignorant. <laughs> Just saying. Um, but as Jesus is telling this, he's not telling it to our culture. As, if we run today, it's because we wanted to see somebody. In their culture, this, it, this is nothing to us. In their culture, it made everyone who heard it grasp. Because in this culture, men didn't run. 
it was dishonorable and humiliating for a man to run. It was to say, it was to say the humility to take off your crown, step down off of your porch, put on flesh and humble yourself even to the point of death. This is not about the prodigal son. This is about a father who saw you far away and decided to humble himself even to the point of death. Take on your sin, take on your shame, and take it to the grave and defeat it for you and give you his victory. It says, while you were far away, he took off running. While you were far away, he humbled himself. While you were far away, he died in their darkest hour that God, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for the world. This is a so kind of love. This isn't a kind, this isn't a fly-by-night kind of love. This is the kind of love that will change your entire trajectory of your life. This is the kind of love that we have is that Christ died for you and I. And I love this, I love, man, I love this so much because he approaches, as you can think about for a moment, the son sees his father jump off of the porch and take off running like a little child. And you're thinking, oh my goodness, I'm in trouble. I'm thinking he's getting a running start, elbow. <laughs> that it's, it's human nature to think God's mad at you. It's human nature to think, oh, he's just waiting for you to make one more mistake. It's human nature to think that you are one mistake away from ruining your eternity. You are one mistake away from failing. You're one mistake away from getting outside of the grace and the mercy of God. It's interesting, isn't it? Well, you see this as he approaches the sun. You can think for a moment the anxiety that the sun began to have, but it's not about the sun. It's about the father. Because he gets to the sun, and you can see the sun like, Dad, I'm really so. And his, the Bible says that the father embraces the son and kisses his neck. And you see this, right? You see this moment. Dad, I'm not even worthy to be your son. Dad, I, I just want to be a, a servant in your house. I just want to be, watch, if you notice, the dad doesn't even listen to none of it. Doesn't ask questions. Don't ask who he was with, what he did, how he did it. He ignores the son altogether and says, hey, go get a ring, a robe, and some sandals because my son who was dead is now alive. Why is he not worried about what the son did? Because when Jesus gets through doing what he does, he didn't pay for some of the sin or kind of the sin or parts of the sin, but he paid for the whole sin of the humanity, and God loves that people. And no matter where you're at, where you're going, where you came from, he says, go get a robe and a ring. And watch this. Sit down. Nobody's preaching. He says, watch this, because now we see culture. Now we see humanity because we have talked about the one son, but we haven't talked about the son who stayed. And we see this moment. And the son goes, hey, yo, time out. Offsides, flag. Time. We need a group meeting. Come here. Time out. Um, what are you doing? Don't you know? Did, do you not know what he did? Don't you know who he did it with? Don't you know he took half? Or half. Already. And can't you see the moment? I love this moment. Because the dad says, hey, calm down. If I was dead, he would be without hope. But you need to understand something. I'm alive. Which means my mercy is still alive. Which means my grace is still alive. Which means my mercy is still alive. Which means my love has yet to fail. I've been earning since he left. What this is, 
is he saying when I get through, when I get through what, doing what I'm going to do, there's still enough. Because I'm not the God of halfway. I'm not the kind, kind of God that has to sacrifice his son 2,000 years later again. Jesus is not going to die again and again for what you did. He died once and for all. And when he died, he took every ounce of it into the grave. And every ounce of it, he took with him every shortcoming, every weakness, every mistake, every generational curse, every disease, followed him into the grave. And when he got through doing what he was doing, what the, what the father is telling the son is, calm down, I'm not dead. There is more than enough to go around. I love humanity and I love every one of them and I'm going to die for every one of them and I can save every one of them. This is the gospel message of Jesus Christ. It's an all-inclusive paid trip. And he says, because I'm alive, he says, son, calm down. Because I'm alive, there's more than enough. There's more than enough. There's more than enough for you more than enough for me there's more than enough because he will never run dry because if he had been dead but he was alive and because he was alive grace was alive and because he was alive mercy was alive and because he was alive his love was alive and he says I have enough for you to spoil it and soil every last one of it. And when you get back, I got enough for both of you still. Watch this, the Israelites and the Gentiles. When I get through doing what I've done, that for God so loved the, the world, it means that there is nobody safe from the love of God. When Jesus died on that cross and spilled his blood, he brought every single person near and every single person because it is by grace through faith. Is this about you? Negative, Ghost Rider. This is not about you whatsoever. You could not mess this thing up even if you wanted to because God is still alive and his grave is empty. And if the grave is empty, it means that we are not. That is mercy still available. It's new every morning. The Bible says it like this, that the way that, that all have fallen short of the glory of God. Both of these sons have something in common. Both of them needed daddy. It puts you and I, whether you've been in church your entire life or this is your first time in church, it puts us all on the same field. Is all have fallen short of the glory of God. We were born into a nature that is going to die. The negative, the bad news is that the wages of our sin is death. That when you are cut off from God, that there is no hope. That sin and God cannot coexist. There is either sinless in the Holy Spirit or there is sin and no hope. It is not about what you've done. It's not about what you. It's not about what you're going to do. You were born this way. I almost titled this message "We're All in This Together," but I didn't want nobody to break out in a song. So, and I wasn't sure whether it was the Holy Spirit or the fact that my two-year-old has watched High School Musical 17 times this week. I was conf I was conflicted. So, but the truth is, we are all in this together. Every one of us, Pastor Tom and I and you, the person in the back, the person that is high right now, the person that got high last night, all of us have something in common, and we all need the blood of Jesus. And the wages of our sin is death. The truth is we are all going to die one day. But the Bible says that but God demonstrated his own love that while you were yet in your sin, Christ died for the ungodly. That if anyone would believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, that they shall be saved. And if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Pastor, it cannot be that simple. Oh, but it is. Because Jesus died, and he took the sins of the world with him, and he came out on the other side. 
and he came on the, out on the other side for you and I so that we could be blameless in the righteousness. The, Bible, the, the gospel message is very simple and very clear. He who knew no sin became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It is became and become. It's that simple. He took on your punishment. I get his victory. He took on your shame and I get peace. He took on your, he took on your junk. And no matter where you are in life, no matter whether you're rich or poor, you still need him. Black or white, you still need him. Hollywood homeless, straight A's, dropouts, we all need Jesus. While you were yet in your sin, Christ died for you. And if you would just believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. And let me just tell you this, you will experience the greatest thing on, the human, on, on this planet, and that is to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and to be filled with joy, love, peace, patience, kindness, long gentleness, faithfulness, and long suffering. You have to understand the greatest thing that Jesus has ever done was not to get you to heaven, but to get heaven to you. And so if with every eye closed and every head bowed today, I just want to say a prayer for you. If, you're, if you came here today to make a decision for Christ, I, this is just an outward expression of what's going on inwardly. I'd like to introduce you to the, the Father, the Father who, is at, who is at the door, waiting at the door. He was waiting for you at the door. With every eye closed and every head bowed, I just want to ask you if, you're, if you want to make a decision for Christ today. If you want to make the Lord and the Savior of the Savior of the world, your Lord and Savior. If you want to receive Christ today, I just want you to lift your hand with every eye closed and every head bowed. Just lift your hand for me really fast. Just lift your hand. Every eye closed, every head bowed. I see your hand. I see your hand. There's hands all over this, all over this place. Church family, would you help me introduce these people that have their hands lifted? You can put your hand down. I want to introduce this family. If you'll just repeat this prayer after me, listen to me. There is nothing supernatural about these words. There's nothing spiritual about these words. There's nothing incredible about these words. If they are only spoken out of a heart that believes them, if, the, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, not confess with your mouth to believe in your heart. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. If you'll repeat after me and church family we don't let nobody do it alone there's no bystanders allowed in this place so if we'll all repeat after me if you want to pray this prayer today say father god i believe i'm a sinner and i need a savior i believe that you became a man and lived a sinless life i believe that you died on the cross for the sins of humanity I believe you were buried, and I believe on the third day you rose from the dead, defeating death, hell, and the grave for me. I believe you are who you said you are. I believe you did what you said you did. I receive right now. If you're saying that prayer, just eyes closed, just throw your hands in the air. Just both hands in the air. Say, I believe. And I receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come quicken my mortal body. I receive baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm adopted, holy, blameless, righteous in your sight. I receive love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control I make you the Lord and the Savior of my life <laughs>